to, I'm going to be talking a bit about a use case that we have for Beam um, and kind of some high level thinking that we've had about how we approach this problem that's kind of been rattling in my head for a period of time. Um, if you have bad vision like I do, uh, you can access the slides at github.com slash x slash slides and then Beam Summit in there. Um, so my name is Devin. I've been at Odin for, you know, almost five years now. Um, I'm responsible for our commitment to Beam. I did a lot of stream processing without frameworks in the past. And then when I joined Odin, we was still a pretty young startup. I, you know, I, someone suggested Beam, looked into it, and I fall in love with it. Um, and that generally means that I'm the Beam guy, which means that every time there's a major outage, I get at mentioned in Slack. Um, and luckily, there are many outages these days because things have gotten better. But um, yeah, that's kind of been my role at the company. Um, in this talk, I'm going to talk about change point detection, um, what really I mean by change point detection. Um, I'm going to talk about why Odin does change point detection. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the methods we're using or methods we have used trying to approach it. And I'm going to talk a little about smoothed change point detection, which I thought was going to be an interesting separate thing, but it's actually very related. Um, and then what the impacts of like sparsity and lateness and the order of your events are when you're trying to do change point detection. Um, to give a little bit of background, I'm just going to talk about Odin real quick. Um, so our customers are these manufacturers, so they're factories. Um, they're in plastic extrusion, injection molding, pipes, chemical, paper and pulp, that kind of stuff. They're process and quality engineers. They're engineers like us. It's just instead of computers, they're working with very physical, real things. Um, we do something that looks a lot like New Relic or Datadog. It's an analytics product. We provide So the metrics that we are providing them go directly to them. Um, and the only difference between what you're used to and what they're used to is that it's real sensors. Uh, and then we do a lot of real time stuff. So we do like alerting and real time streaming of metrics, all that fun stuff. So we care a lot about things happening in real time. And so that's gonna be a big theme in this talk is worrying about the real timiness of the stream processing. Um, talking a little bit about how Odin uses Beam. So um, we ingest all of this raw data from factories. Uh, I say raw, it's really coming out of uh, PLCs. So PLC stands for the Programmable Logic Controller. The Programmable Logic Controller was invented by Dick Morley, January 1st, 1968, during a hangover, because he didn't want to do his work. I think we can all relate to it. Um, and we do all this stuff, like we combine events. Uh, so we do this transformation with Beam, where we transform the PLC data into event data that makes sense to us. We do a lot of like combining of stuff. Uh, the classic examples, if you take two, you have two sensors that are measuring the same thing and you want to get like the average of them, we'll do that in real time. Uh, we do a lot of like customer configurable transformation as opposed to them hire a contractor to write custom code. They just do some configuration with us and we do that. We apply that configuration in real time. And we do this thing where we turn these metrics they send us and make them into contextual intervals. And I'm going to talk about what I mean by that. Um, but the practical reality is it means there's a lot of side input joining, there's a lot of windowing, and there's a lot of caring a lot about stuff being fast. Um, at a really high level, this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, we ingest the data from the PLC, it gets transformed, and then it splits in these two types of data at a high level. They're separated as pub subtopics. There's the intervals data, and then there's the metric data. Um, you might be looking at this and being like, wow, this is such a simple, beautiful, elegant architecture. In reality, it looks a lot more like this. Um, there are like loops, and there are things that don't do anything, and there are things that seem like they don't do anything, but spew errors. Um, so for this talk, I'm going to pretend that it was the simple model. Um, our data kind of looks something like this. So, uh, this is, this is the data for a line. So a line is kind of like the base unit of work that you would see at a factory. Um, if you were a factory that made teddy bears, you'd have a line that was just chugging out teddy bears and you'd be measuring things like how fluffy is my teddy bear and how many teddy bears per minute am I outputting? And, um, this is a much less interesting line. This line is measuring... Uh, cable manufacturing. I take that back. Cable manufacturing is really interesting, but uh, maybe less successful. Uh, and when we look at this broken down, you can kind of see the things about the line and about the cable that's being made. So down here we have metrics, which are things that you're used to. They're things that you would see in like Stackdriver or one of these other pro these other you know services you already use. They're sampled data points about like numeric values about a real thing. Like there's a real underlying continuous value and you are sampling data point after data point after data point. At the top part, we have contextual data. So for example, we have the availability of the line. Is the line running or is it not? And you can actually see the metrics change when it goes from being down to being up. Uh, what's the water status? Water matters a lot in cable manufacturing because you got to cool things down. Um, 
And then who's running the line? Who's the operator? They have a number. They have a name too in reality. Uh, but in our system, they have a number. Uh, and that's really inf important information. And a lot of our joining and you know, analytics that we do or stuff where we're joining this contextual information against this metric information and trying to say things like who how what operators should be working with to you know improve their ability to do certain things or who has figured out the right way to manufacture teddy bears things like that um and so in our pipeline it looks something like this the data comes in we've got these metrics and a metric describes really like a real world sensor it's like a heat it's a speed it's a gear motion it's some there's some real unit that are often in uh imperial units and i've learned a lot of imperial units i didn't think i would ever have to know. Um, and each value is a float, it's a linear value, it's a number, and we sample it at a rate about once per second. On the interval side, it's a little bit different. Um, it's a categorical value, there's no linear value to it. And we only get the value when the thing changes, when they start running the line or the operator changes, we just get that one value at that time. And so the problem that I'm gonna focus on is this interesting use case where they don't have in their system already an interval, and we need to suss it out from the metric data that they're providing us. So this is one of those like key transformations that we offer to our customers, which is just that like they're giving us metric data and they know the metric data means something. And we want to in real time, turn that into some sort of useful context. So use case, turning intervals into, or creating intervals from metrics. Um, so I think everyone should recognize this. If you don't, then you're missing out. It's a banger. Uh, this is a really great visualization for thinking about processing events. Um, the x-axis is event time and the y-axis is process time. And all of these events are perfectly on time because they are going at a perfect you know, slope of one all the way up. Um, this is really good for talking about things like things being on time is when they're on that perfect slope of one. Things being late are when they're above that little slope of one. Things being out of order, you can see here the fourth element actually arrived after the fifth element. So it is out of order and you can visualize this with this. Um, you can apply this like real world scenarios. So like this was that photo we took earlier. Um, the photographer was on time and then some people were on time. And then there was this like random smattering of people who were supposed to be there at a certain time and they arrived really late. Um, and we can then like draw a window over this and we can say that the window didn't trigger until everybody showed up. And so the process time, you know, took this window and made it really, really tall. Um, and so what we're gonna talk about is we're gonna talk about visualizing this change that's happening. So for the purpose of this exercise, we're just gonna say that change is when the color changes. And so this is the canonical use case. There's, there's other ones we use, but I think it's the easiest one to talk about, which is just like detecting when the line is running. Um, so right here, we kind of have just have one interval and one metric. The metric that we're looking at here is the line speed. So it's just how fast is the line moving? And when it exceeds a certain threshold, we're gonna say the line is now up. And you might think that doesn't matter that much, but it, it's huge. Because in manufacturing, this is how you define availability. So this is like, if I have equipment, how available is it? How much is it actually running? Um, and availability is one of the three major factors of overall equipment efficiency, which is like the, the de facto standard of how you measure whether or not your factory is profitable and how you make your factory more profitable. So us measuring this correctly is critical to our customers understanding, are we making money? Can we make money? How do we make more money? Things like that. Like, are we providing ROI? And so in this case, you can kind of you can kind of see this is this breakdown of how we're going to do that kind of mapping. Um, we're we're going to map these metrics into a categorical value using customer configuration. Um, on the left, we've got this code here that kind of high level describes it, but it's one of these kind of like common patterns you see in a lot of like Beam blog posts. You create this generate sequence that updates a new value every minute. You map that value into some sort of request for a new configuration. You turn that into a P collection view. You load that in as a side input, and then you do some sort of detection. And you're like, if I'm above or below my configured threshold, I'm going to make it an up event or a down event. And you can see we're taking linear values and turning them into categorical values. There's strings in this example, which is not what we're really doing, but it's easy enough to think about that way. Um, and yeah, change detection, this is not the change detection. This is just how do we map it into the values. And the change detection is really hard and something we think a lot about because doing it in real time and showing it to our customers in real time is really important. So this is a screenshot from our platform. This is like a view that we would provide to a supervisor and a supervisor would want to be able to see he's, he or she is overlooking you know many lines. Um, and there are lots of operators who are operating these different lines and their job is to kind of oversee this stuff 
and see like if there's a long extended downtime period or an unexpected downtime, I need to rush out and go work with that operator to make sure we can get them running again because that is money being burned. Um, so how do we do this? Uh, so the naive solution, the first one that we approached when we tried to do this was just using beam state. Um, so beam state, for those who don't know, is a really nifty feature. Um, you create the state spec of some sort of value. Um, we are going to say the state spec is probably like a float and we're just going to store what the previous value was uh, as we're processing the events that are coming through. Um, as I was thinking about it, I almost feel like the state should be on the right side, process time, but whatever. But so you're comparing these two values to each other and trying to decide whether or not uh, you just kind of go through piece by piece and you compare them and you decide when they're different, you now know that change event has happened. And so you can see that change event happened at the fourth event. Um, there are issues with this. Uh, the issues are it doesn't deal with out of order. So in this case, the fifth event was the second, the fourth event was the event where it changed, but it arrived after the fifth event. And by just using beam state, we trick ourselves into thinking that it's changed when it really hasn't, because we're holding over that blue value from the third event all the way back there. So this is just a bad detection. So beam state is completely flawed in approaching it this way. And this was our naive approach, and you know it got us a certain distance, but um, we're not guaranteed order, and we should not expect it of you know our sources. Um, the next thing we can kind of look at is watermark triggered windows. Um, so a window is when you draw a box around some dots. Uh, so a window is, this is a sliding window. Uh, so we are capturing, you know, uh, for every, every two seconds in width, we're moving it over one second and we are trying to determine whether or not, uh, we're seeing a change within that window. So the change we're seeing here is when we just have those two elements right next to each other and they're different. And we have all the information we need in the world with right there within that window to say that a change happened here. Um, and this is really great because it deals with out of order. You don't run into the same issue you ran into with the uh, beam state because the window doesn't get triggered until it has all of its elements inside of it or actually until the watermark is past it. Um, so this is a much stronger solution for detecting the change. You don't need to rely on order at all. Um, there is an issue with it, uh, which is that it's really closely, it's triggering behavior is really going to be closely tied to lag. Um, so as you can kind of see here, we're triggering it not on the element itself, but when the next element shows up, right? And the reason for that is because it's when the window has exceeded the watermark and the watermark is determined by the events that are coming in, who is the youngest event that I have seen. Um, and so you just have an absolute lag here, which isn't that bad, um, but it's, it is a real thing. Uh, it's something that we have to be kind of concerned about. Um, but the more notable problem is that it's, it's not just a watermark lag issue for that specific key or that particular line. So a common problem that we deal with at Odin is the fact that our lag is what I like to call non-homogeneous. Um, so homogeneous, that's probably a better way to say it. Um, so these are factories. You can tell they're factories. They have smoke coming out of them. Um, and one of them is red, so it's bad. That's lagging data. Uh, so one factory is pushing events far later than the other factories. And what that, ha what that causes is they all end up going to the same pub subtopic. They all get processed by the same jobs. And the watermark is global for the job. So the entire, so all the events end up lagging as a result. Um, and if you want to know more about this specific issue, um, this is actually very related to the talk that you guys just listened to because it has to do with uh, batch processing. I gave a talk on this um, last summit called Leveraging Beam's Batch Mode for Robust Recoveries and Late Data Processing of Streaming Pipelines, which is a mouthful. Um, but we basically approached a very late lagging problem by doing the kind of like batch streaming hybrid solution thing. Um, but there's still a very real problem where we have just continuous streaming lag that we have to deal with. Sometimes you just end up with like clocks that are not properly configured in factories. It's, it's a real issue. Clock drift is very real. Um, and so, yeah, what this looks like is I could have a partic my particular line could be perfectly on time, but it's triggering significantly later because there's some other, there's a high watermark caused by some other factories bad data. So we have slow detection here. Another solution we can approach here that we've kind of explored is data-driven tr triggers. So uh, a data-driven trigger is, one where you're basically, I mean, the only data-driven trigger that's exposed in Beam is the number of elements. So that's one we kind of have to use. It'd be great if we could do more. But um, in this case, basically, we can just say, well, if I feel really confident I get an element every second, uh, 
um, then I can just make my, I can just say when I have my sliding window of two seconds wide, I have two elements in it, then I know I have everything I need and I can trigger it and go on with my life. And if I knew I got a, a data point every two seconds, I could do the math and, you know, account for that as well. Um, and yeah, and so in this case, the one thing you do have to be aware of this is that you do have to make it a repeatedly forever triggering trigger at this point, at this point because you are going to have duplicate values. So you are going to trigger sometimes um, with like duplicates of the first element and don't have the second element yet. Um, but the nice thing about this is that you're either not going to produce a change event or you're going to produce a change event. And if you do produce a change event, it's going to be the same change event, I think. Maybe there's differences sometimes. I have to think about that. Um, it's not the ideal solution and it can get a little messy. Um, and then we kind of get into an issue with both of those solutions, which is just sparseness of your data. Um, so in both those cases, we were setting a very fixed width to our window, right? We were saying like the window is two seconds wide or something. Maybe in, in our case, I think it's actually minutes wide usually. But um, if your data is more spread out than that, if you're not guaranteed delivery of the events, then you're not going to have be guaranteed that you end up with an event within that window. And you're not going to actually process it. Um, so in this case, you know, our window is only two seconds wide, but we're getting a data point really infrequently, not as frequently as once every two seconds. So we just don't detect a change. We just don't have enough state to see that it happened. Um, and so what you could do here is you can basically say, um, and this is the watermark driven triggered solution. You can say, uh, well, my window width should be the, uh, should just be greater than whatever the maximum delta is, like whatever the maximum sparsity is that I have to worry about. So that's one potential solution to this. Um, and if you feel really confident about it, I think this definitely works. Um, and if you were to approach this with a data-driven trigger solution, you actually now have to move, because now you don't know what the frequency is. You probably never knew what your frequency was. Um, you have to trigger the window every single time, every time there's a new element that comes in. Um, and that's really annoying. Um, it's very expensive. You just do a lot of computation that doesn't really add up to anything. I think it's like some sort of exponential growth in the amount of, you know, triggering you're doing. So it's not pretty. Um, and you also get in this weird situation where like, how do I know when I have all the events? So was there a change at T3? Um, and this was something that we've discussed really for a while. And I mean, there's, there's other situations where you might think about this. Like you might do a watermark driven trigger and then, you know, some sort of process time delay because you think some events may show up even past the watermark and you, you need to do some sort of like probabilistic model where you're like, I say probabilistic, I, I really mean like sum up the values and divide them and figure out the spacing and see if that matches up. But you're trying to decide like, is there some underlying frequency or is it totally random and do i feel really confident that the change happened where the change happened um so this is this is the kind of weird space that we have gotten to this is about as far as we've gotten to with just windows as a solution um to talk about another use case that we have um and this one i thought was going to be very different when I was originally putting together this talk um there's also this idea that we focus on which is smoothing intervals um, and I've realized in retrospect, it's actually really related to what I was just talking about. So smoothing intervals are this thing where, you know, uh, machines are kind of like people. Uh, machines are cranky. They, they don't always want to wake up in the morning. They don't always want to start right away. Uh, so there's lots of false starts you see with machines. And generally, we just don't want to measure those. We don't want to. There's false starts. There's false starts. There's stops. There's juddering behavior. We don't want to send someone off to look at this. Um, and we really want to wait till we hit that point where it's a continuous amount of uptime. Um, and so we want to build a model around this that handles this really well. So we want to think about this exact same problem. In this case, we can pretend that we care about two seconds of data before uh, we say that it's actually the change event. Um, and so what's cool about this is you can actually think about this by just making it a sparseness problem. You can just say, I'm going to eliminate the first n data points or the first n seconds of data points. Um, and that is equivalent to the smoothing at that point. Um, and now we've gone back to exactly what we were looking at before. The one additional thing is you are keeping track of when the start of that was, but if you just, you're just removing those data points from the, the, you know, the formula. Um, and now we can go back to our solution before and the solution from before is like, we now have this window and the window size is now just the max, not just the maximum Delta, but the maximum Delta plus the smoothing. And uh, one really weird thing about this is if you do this kind of smoothing behavior, you end up always creating lag. Uh, so in this case, like we're waiting a couple seconds for the data point to show up. We're always, however many seconds we're waiting 
to be really confident that we have enough data, that's the number of seconds that we're going to force lag onto our pipeline. So um, we're kind of careful with this one because we throw those values back into the same pub subtopics and we introduce lag in other places of our pipeline and we you know, shoot ourselves in the foot even further with watermarks. Um, so that's one thing to be aware of that's a little bit weird. Um, and so all this brings me back to probably the third and, you know, maybe weirdest solution, which is to, we, we've talked about how, uh, you know, state has this problem where it handles sparsity, but it doesn't handle out of orderness. And Windows handle out of orderness, but they don't handle sparsity. So what if we combine them? Um, and so in this case, we, we think back to our, our window uh, solution. What you're really thinking about is you're, you're taking the window and you're splitting it into two sections. You're creating the part where I care about where the change event happened and then some sort of pseudo state like that's really the reason why the window is so large. You're just trying to figure out like this is my pseudo belief of what history was. Um, and we can just add state into this formula. Um, and so if we add state into this formula, we get the best of both worlds to an extent. Um, and if I don't fall into the pseudo state, I will at least have the state sitting around in the beam state from before. Um, and so this creates this situation where, you know, uh, in the far left use case where we have really sparse data, it works because we have the previous value sitting in the beam state. And in the uh, middle case where we get data out of order, it still works because the window accounts for the fact that it's out of order. And then in the last case where things are sparse and out of order, it does not work because there's no perfection. Um, and I've been trying to think of like, what is the correct way to determine? Like this is, there's a formula to this. I don't think this is right, by the way. Um, and I've been trying to figure out what the right way to describe it is, but there's something like, you know, the smooth time plus the event time delta max plus the out of order max is less than the process time delta max. Like something like that is when this third case falls apart. Um, and it, maybe it's like some Pythagorean thing, but I'm still thinking out what this really looks like. And I think I need to like sleep on it a bit more. Um, but yeah, so in summary, uh, so key takeaways. We use change point detection to transform metrics into intervals. It's really useful. It's a great feature. Customers love it. It's one of the rare things that we provide to customers that, you know, really just feels like magical to them. Not rare. Lots of things we do are magical. But like, it really is a unique thing for them. They don't have to do any additional work. It just works out of the box, which is great. Um, beam state is fast and good at sparsity, but it's going to be bad at out of order. Windowing is slower and good at out of order, but bad at sparsity. Um, and then combining beam state and windowing is pretty good at both. Um, and then the smooth change point detection problem that we talked about is actually just a sparsity problem, which is kind of nice. Um, so thank you. Um, and also a special thanks to um, Jay, Jake, and Deepak, who are my coworkers and my boss. Um, Jake figured out all these use cases originally by writing like dozens and dozens of tests trying to figure out. And then Jay had to translate all that to Python to Java because the Python was not performant um, and improved it in the process. And Deepak was the first one who recognized the kind of like customer use case and implemented it. Um, but yeah, that's all I've got.